Good morning, church. It's a glorious day. But not because of the sun outside. I know it's nice, but because our Lord is here and we are here together, a gathering, family, to sing his praises, to praise him. Listen to these words of the psalmist. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Welcome to our service, to Broadmead Gathering, Family Gathering. Please stand if you can to sing our first hymn, Above All. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began, above all Ever know 
of all wealth and treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, lay behind the star, and live to die, rejected and We thank you, Lord, for what you've done for each one of us. You thought of us. You thought of each one of us. And you called us. You loved us. You saved us. You've dressed us. Your righteousness. Blessed be your name. Blessed are your works. Who is like you, Lord? Nothing is compared to our Lord, to our God, who would have thought that our creator <clears throat> himself come to save us, to give us life, dress us in his righteousness, your righteousness that we don't deserve, Lord. Your ways are different from our ways and your thoughts far away from our thoughts. Your wisdom is above all, Lord. Your wisdom and your power. You've shown those on the cross. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Sing our next hymn <clears throat> together. Come, now is the time to worship Come, now 
is the time to give your heart Come just as you are to worship Come just as you are before your God Let's pray. Yes, Lord, we come as we are. With open hands, empty hands. As we are, Lord, to receive from you. We thank you, Lord, that you are our God. Blessed good Lord, we gather today by your grace and mercies in Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you for this day, how good and pleasant it is when your family come together in unity of heart and mind, trusting you are here with us now. You deserve all honor and all praise and all glory for all your good works in Christ. Bless our gathering, Lord. Bless our worship. Accept our prayers and bless your word in our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit. We want you glorified in every part of today's service. We pray this for every church gathering today in this country and in the world, north, south, east, and west, singing your praises in Christ Jesus. We pray in his blessed name, God with us, Emmanuel. Amen.
children. What is this? Well, who can? Can you hear me? Good. Who can drink it in 15 seconds? I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I can't do that. What is this? Who likes to eat one? Later, not now. If I drop this in the jug, in the water, would it sink or flow? Who said sink? Others? Would it float or sink? Shall we give it a go? It's floating. You didn't expect that, right? Okay. Now let's try something else. If I peeled a bit of the skin, would it float? Yes or no? Who said no? Oh, she's a prophet. <laughs> It would sink or float? Oh dear. Let's try another one. We'll remove the whole skin. Now, would it float or sink? Float? Why did you change your mind? Oh dear. Why is that? What? Come on, clever kids, come on. Why is this floating and the others are down at the bottom? What's the difference between that one which is floating and those under? What's the difference between the two? What did I remove? You see, that skin protected that clementine from sinking. And the word of God in the letter of Jude tells us that we are protected in Christ. We are protected, shielded in Christ. The beloved people of God, those who believe in Christ, are protected, are shielded, are kept in Christ. So if you are in Christ, no matter what happens in your life, you are in him saved now into eternity. Amen. We'll eat it later. We'll sing our next hymn, Give Me Oil in My Lamp. I love this hymn. I love this song. Do you love it? It's for us, not for you, children. It's for us, children. Sing. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, and special welcome to Henry, who's come to um, lead our service today and preach. And he's a minister in training at um, a church in Chadwell Heath. Um, I hope you've all seen the new sheet. I hope you you've read it in some form um just to draw your attention to a few things first of all the prayer meeting on tuesday at eight o'clock that's a very important meeting in the life of the church so please be there if you can and before that if you're helping with the holiday club there's a meeting at seven o'clock so if you've said you'll help can you be there for that and on, it's a very busy week on wednesday um if you're free at 2 30 it's our rendezvous rendezvous meeting when um, Pauline will be coming to um, talk to us about how the Paul, um, the Rose Walton Centre, which is at Mill Grove, came into being. And an important notice from Sade and Nicole, um, if you're planning to come to the Blessed P Picnic on Saturday, that's for the ladies, can you um, let Sade know by the end of the service, please? And there's a little note about food. And over the page, there are some different things on page two. Um, and one of them is a note from Brian about the good newspapers. And if somebody could help um, to give some out, that would be great. Thank you. While we collect the offering, um, we'll sing a hymn, Give Thanks.
Please. Heavenly Father, we give you from what you gave us. You've blessed us. Bless this offering. You are the one who is rich and we are the poor. We thank you for caring for each one of us. We know, Lord, you are our father, our carer, our savior. Bless this offering. Bless every heart that gave joyfully, Lord. You bless the joyful heart who gives joyfully. Please accept them. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. There's water here, so I don't want to. Clive, please come and read from the Word of God. Morning, church. Um, this morning's reading is Galatians um, chapter 6, and it's verse 1 to 10, and it is in page 1384, 1384 in the Church Bible. Do good to everyone. Brothers and sisters, what if someone is caught in sin? Then you who live by the sin should correct that person. Do it in a gentle way, but be careful. You could be tempted to carry one another's heavy load. If you do, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If, you want, if everyone thinks they are somebody when they are nobody, they are foolish themselves. These persons should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves. They won't be comparing themselves to someone else. Each person should carry their own load. But those who are taught the word should share all good things with their teacher. Don't be fooled. You can't outwit God. A man gathers a crop from what he plants. Some people plant to please their desires controlled by sin. From these desires, they will harvest death. Others plant to please the Holy Spirit from the Spirit there will harvest eternal life. Let us not become tired of doing good. At the right time we will gather the crop if we don't give up. So when we can do good to everyone, let us do it. Let's try even harder to be good for the family of believers. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Clive. May our Lord bless his word in our hearts and minds. It's time to pray. So let's bow our heads. And may our Lord in his spirit leads you in your prayers. And lead our prayers. Whatever is important to pray for whatever words God gives you praising thanking asking seeking please may the Holy Spirit lead you in your prayers
We thank you, Lord. We trust that you hear each prayer. Because we are in Christ. And we ask everything in the name of your Son, your blessed Son, your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us and rose and gave us life. Lord, you can hear every prayer, every need, every thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord, for being in our lives to this day, keeping us in faith to this moment in time. We trust your power. We trust the power of your resurrection. We trust your wisdom. We trust your word. You alone can keep us, Lord. Help us. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you, to live for you and to live faithfully for you. Lord, bless each heart. Bless each head in this place. Lord, we need you, especially these days and the current turmoil in the world, wars and rumors of wars. Lord, help us to stand firm in faith and never be not to be shaken. Please, Lord. We are weak, but in you, we get strength from you, Lord. Help us to stand firm in faith. In the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Don't, don't give up. Do not give up. When things are not happening, we give up. We lose heart. Have you made that resolution at the beginning of this year of losing those few pounds you've gained over Christmas? Enjoyed those, that food, drinks, cakes, sweets. January the 1st comes, you make your resolution and you start on the 2nd of January. Many have tried it and attempted and went for it. But with time, they find themselves tired and weary of following that diet stopping eating, doing those exercises. With time, they lose patience. And that enthusiasm turns into despair. And they give up and they stop. Or that sailor who's rowing against the tide, against the waves, they are too strong for him. He tries and tries and tries, but he's overwhelmed by the power of the waves. So he surrenders and let the waves take him in his direction. When things don't happen, we lose heart and we give up. When we reach the end of the tether, as the parable says, which I've learned it here, does it happen in the Christian life? Did it happen to you? I think most of us have been there. Sometimes we lose heart, we become weary, tired of living the Christian faith. Maybe some of us now are in that situation. Why should I live the Christian life? When we give up, when we surrender 
and slowly become inactive in our daily Christian life and in our service to the Lord. The warning is there. The exhortation is there, but the encouragement also is there from the word of God, from the Holy Spirit, from God himself. If you find yourself in that situation, Paul says, do not give up. Do not lose heart. Continue living your Christian life and believe. We may lose art because of the pressures of living the Christian life, the Christian standards, the Christian teachings, especially in today's culture, which is almost against any Christian teaching and any, against any teaching, any Christian standards. Or perhaps some of, some of us give up because of persecution for the name of Christ and for the gospel, for preaching the gospel, or perhaps the unrest that we suffer in our lives, while others who are non-believers are having good time. They are enjoying their life. They are happy, but I am not happy. I'm a Christian. I thought when I become a Christian, all my troubles will disappear. Why should I continue? So I stop living as a Christian believer. Perhaps I'll stop praying or praying in faith or continuously praying. I'll give up on praying because nothing is happening. Nothing is changing. So why should I continue? We are all, all of us susceptible to this temptation to give up and to stop living as Christian believers. Our Lord knows that. Paul knows that. Peter knows that. But there is a way out. Look at me, with me, at the beginning on the end of verse 9, if you have your Bibles open in front of you or if it's on the screen. Look at the beginning and the end of verse 9 which Clive read for us. Don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. And at the end, don't give up. Give up in, on what? Or in what? In doing the good. To whom? To others. But specifically and especially to the people of God, to the brothers and sisters in the church. Don't give up on doing the good to the church and to, the, and to others, the outsiders. Continue doing that good. And Paul uses an illustration to teach us to understand what he means by that. He uses an illustration, sowing the seed, doing the good to others and to the people of God, to the house of God, is like planting the seeds, sowing the seeds. So what are the seeds? My first point is, what are the seeds that we are sowing in the church, in my Christian life, in my personal life? What are those seeds? What kind of seeds? <clears throat> what is this, the good that Paul is referring here to, or he's talking about here? I hope today, after, when you go back, after you enjoy your Sunday lunch or dinner, that you have time to read this letter, and specifically chapters 5 and 6, to discover what Paul means by the good that he wants us to sow in our lives, and in the church, and in those around us. If you look in chapter 5, Paul gives us two lists of seeds. List of good seeds, and list of wicked or bad seeds. 
and the harvest will follow after the kind of that seed. And there are two fields. You either sow to the spirit or you sow to the flesh. In chapter 5, we read in verse 22, if the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. So what kind of seed then you are sowing in yourself and in the church, and what will be the harvest that will benefit you and others? The harvest will be love. The harvest will be joy. It will be patience, self-control. That's what you are sowing in yourself and in the church. And imagine the consequences of that. For example, verses 6 and 7, chapter 5. The seed of active faith in love, being obedient to the truth of the gospel of the cross, or walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh, the difference between the two. Or what about restoring that fallen brother or sister to win him back? That word restore is the same word that is used in the Gospels when the disciples were mending the nets. It's exactly the same word. Mending and restoring in Greek is exactly the same word. So what the disciples were doing, they were mending the nets, restoring the nets to be reused again for fishing. If we have a fallen brother or sister in the church, how we are going to restore him, to win him back, to be useful in the church. You either sow to the flesh or you sow to the spirit, and the harvest will follow. But if you sow the seeds of anger, pride, envy, jealousy, indiscipline, which is the opposite of self-control, rivalry, or division, what do you expect to happen in your life and in the church? Imagine the church had sown over years, believers within the church had sown those seeds in the church. What will happen to that church? It's destructive. Those seeds are seeds of destruction. If you sow something, you will reap after its kind. This is the law that God has embedded in nature and he has embedded even in the spiritual life in his kingdom. We reap what we sow and we only reap what we sow. And if we don't sow anything, we will not reap anything. And if you stop sowing, that means you are not planting. So don't expect fruits if you are not sowing anything. The foundations are there in Genesis 1 and 2. The law of creation, all these principles are there in Genesis 1 and 2. What we sow, we will reap harvest after its kind. You sow the seeds of grapes. You will get grapes, not pomegranates. Harvest after the kind of the seed we sow. There will be harvest. And Paul says, do not sneer at God. God cannot be mocked. Sometimes we think we know better. So we sow seeds the way we want to, to sow them. Seeds that are not according to the word of God. But let's remember, whatever we sow, whether in the world, and look at the history of the world, whatever we sow in the church, and look at the history of the church, and where we are now, we will always read what has, what has been sown or have been sown years and years ago.
We only reap what we sow. We cannot change the foundations of life that are in Genesis. Why would we give up doing the good? Why would we stop sowing love, gentleness, kindness? Someone will say it's very demanding. It's too much. And it's not rewarding. There is no payback. I'm not benefiting from what I'm, I'm doing in the church. I've been doing all things, this and that in the church, and nobody appreciates me. Nobody is even saying to me, thank you. So I stop sowing and I stop doing that good, which is benefiting to the others. Thinking like that, stopping doing the good is sowing to the flesh, not sowing to the spirit. The sinful nature kicks in always and makes us rebel against all that is good and righteous and loving. I am thinking selfishly and I'm acting selfishly if I'm having that thought. And perhaps you've noticed from the reading that who is in control of the growth and of the harvest? It is God who is in control of the harvest. In due time, in his time, he will bring the harvest. He will bring the fruit that will benefit the church. Perhaps you are doing something good now, but you are not seeing the results yet. But in due time, it's under his control. He will bring those. Any seed of goodness you plant in your life, in your personal life, in your church, I'm saying your church, but it's the Lord's church. Anything, any good seed you plant in the church will bring food. God will bring the fruit and the harvest to benefit the church and to benefit the world. He's in control. We might be in control of what we sow, but the harvest is beyond our control. But it's under his control. Even when we sow the bad seed, he's there, he's in control, and he will control that too. Is that how we think sometimes when after years of serving the Lord, after years of serving the church, after years of having this fellowship with our brothers and sisters, do we come to this way of thinking selfishly and then stop acting and become active, and we withdraw from the church. Paul says, be careful not to think like that and not to act accordingly. If I stop planting the seeds, the good seeds, I'm like that farmer who has seeds, but he did not plant it. And don't expect harvest if you don't plant the seed. This is, as I said, is sowing to the flesh, not to the spirit. So, what is that motivate you or me as a church? What motivate us to do the good? If I am paralyzed by this thought that I'm doing all that good, I'm not benefiting from it, I'm not being rewarded by it, then I'm drifting away from Jesus. I'm drifting away from the gospel of the cross. Our Lord, who showed all that love and acted in love and did all that goodness, to each one of us by dying on that cross for me, for you, and for others. That's the ultimate good. Is that our motivation or our selfish rewarding motivation? I move away from the gospel of grace. I'm not thinking gracefully. 
our Lord who sacrificed everything for each one of us. I'm not motivated by the cross, but by my selfish, sinful thinking and desires. With time, I'm not sure if you have seen this happening to others, but with time, two things happen. Either you stop and leave the church and go back to your old life. I was happier then. I was rewarded then. And I'm much happier when I was not a Christian. The Christianity didn't bring me anything, uh, any joy in my life. I'm still having problems. So you fall away from grace and you go back to the old way of living. Or the other danger is that I become... <clears throat> that I become angry, resentful, indignant, and judgmental. Because I start thinking of myself, I am better than others. I am above others. I'm doing everything while they are doing nothing. I don't need them. They may need, they might need me, but I don't need them. And then you start pulling yourself, causing divisions in the church. You might start looking for people who are like you, causing more division in the church. But we know this is arrogance and self-righteousness. You will become a Pharisaic Christian, thinking that you are better than others. I don't have burdens. I will carry my own burdens. But I will not anybody share also my burdens. Each Christian has his own burdens in life. Some you have to carry yourself. I have to carry it myself. But there are other burdens. And that's why two are better than one. Sometimes we need others to help us, to carry our burdens with us, to help us, just as Jesus helped us. That is also sowing to the flesh, not to the spirit. To think of myself, I'm better than my brothers and sisters because I've done a lot in the church and they have done nothing. Clive did nothing. I did this. I did that. I didn't receive any praise or reward or thanksgiving or even thank you. This is again falling from grace. And when I think like that, actually I am falling in the trap of the religion of works, not the gospel of grace. I'm not loving my brothers and sisters, and I'm not loving the Lord. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. I'm not fulfilling the heart of the law, the heart of the gospel, to love God and love your neighbor. If I have that way of thinking that I'm better than others, if I see a fallen brother in the church, how would I react to him? Would I mock him, laugh at him, do everything to kick him out of the church, or try to restore him to the fellowship and to the service? What motivates me to live my Christian life? What motivates me to sow the good seeds? What motivates me to sacrifice for others? What motivates me to help others, help them in their burdens? If it's not the cross, and if it's my own selfish thinking, then I'm falling from the grace. So what is that thing? If I'm motivated by the gospel of grace and by the cross, then what will keep me ongoing? What keeps me to continue on that path? Do I trust myself? Do I trust my knowledge? Do I trust my wisdom? I will decide what is the good seed. I decide when to sow the good seed 
and when to stop sowing the good seed, or I should trust my Lord, and I should trust the Lord of the church, and continue to sow the goodness and the good in the spirit. If we trust the Lord for our salvation, if we trust the Lord for his goodness, if we trust the Lord that he is the one who can keep something, why we don't trust him when we do the good to others, to the church? We trust him that he saved us, that's 100%. No, I have no doubt of that. So why we are doubting that he will bring the fruit of the goodness that we sow in the church? And remember what we are sowing. We will reap it here and in eternal life. We are sowing for the eternal. It is his work. He had prepared good works for each one of us, for his church, to do them. That's the good that he prepared to be done by each one of us. So why we stop doing that? We have the help of the Holy Spirit. We have the help of his word to guide us how to plant those good seeds. Our Lord, the book says in the Gospels that he walked doing good. And he was happy to do that good. When you are doing good works in the church, are you happy doing them? Are you joyful doing them? Or you are, or am I resentful? I'm wanting, I want to have some rewards back for what I am doing. Sometimes we forget that we are saved sinners. The church is the community of saved sinners. We are all susceptible to this temptation. But let's remember that the Holy Spirit is given to us and the word of God is given to us and the fellowship is given to us and the grace is given to us because the Holy Spirit is working in each one of us. He indwells every believer. And the target or the aim is for us to be changed to be in Christ-like character. So if you stop, if you, when you stop sowing the good seed, when you stop doing the good work in the church and in your life, actually you are resisting what the Holy Spirit wants you and to make you like Christ. The Holy Spirit wants to work in us to bring those fruits in our personal life and in the church. Sowing to the Spirit and sowing the good seed, it's hard work. It's not easy to be patient, to be sacrificial, to spend that time with others. Don't ever, that's my way of thinking. I never think that any good you do in the church to any brother and sister, even in the world, it's not a waste of time. It's not a waste of energy. It is in God's hand and he will bring the fruit of that at one point in time. Just tell you a little story. There was this woman, um, who was on the street telling people about Christ, giving them leaflets about Christ, talking to them about Christ, and calling them to repentance. And this guy, someone bypassed, and she talked to him directly. He came back, and he slapped her, and went away. She was in tears, but she stayed there and she continued doing what she was doing. Ten years later, she was in the same place, doing the same thing, talking to people, giving leaflets, preaching. And that person came and stood in front of her. And he said to her, 
don't you recognize me? He said, no, many people bypass me here. And he said to her, I'm that person who slapped you 10 years ago. But I'm a Christian believer now. I believe in Christ. You never know. You never know. She was doing the good. She was proclaiming the gospel and she was suffering for the gospel. She was sacrificing her time, time of her family, time from work and uh, her own personal time, preaching the gospel. Ten years, it's a long time, but there is a fruit. In time, God will bring out the fruit. Don't give up on doing the good in the church. If you are in that position now, don't give up. Don't lose hope. Don't be weary in heart. Continue to do it. As they say, keep on keeping on doing the good in the church. So I would finally say these final words. Let us be renewed in heart and mind. Continue to do the good to the church and others motivated by the cross of Christ and trusting in the Holy Spirit who will enable us to continue without giving up. Don't give up. Doing the good work. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you never gave up on your disciples. You loved them and you kept them. We trust that you will never, never leave your church, your beloved church, that you died for her. Lord, help us, strengthen us. Give us that spirit and that faith not to stop doing the good. It's for your name and for your sake that you will be glorified in everything. We don't want the glory to be ours, but yours. Everything we do, every service is for your name and for your glory for the glory of your work on that cross for each one of us, that you'll be glorified, your name glorified, not our names, not ourselves, because you are worthy of all honor and glory. Lord, I pray for myself, I pray for every believer, and I pray for my brothers and sisters at Broadmead, Lord. Please, Lord, help us not to give up, on your love, on your cross, and keep on telling others and serving others in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing faithful. One.
as our Lord taught us. As we read in the Gospels that on the night he was betrayed, our Lord took the bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying to them, this is my broken body for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Each one of them in remembrance of me. And he also took the cup and gave it to them to drink, saying, this is my blood shed for you. A new covenant I'm making with you in my blood, a covenant that will never, ever perish. It's eternal covenant because he's making it in his own blood. Drink it and do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat, whenever you drink, remember my death, my resurrection, and his return. Whenever we eat this bread, whenever we drink this cup, as a family, family of God, God's people, whenever we eat and drink, we remember these things. His death for us, his resurrection for us, and his return. When we eat and drink, we remember he forgave our sins. When he rose again, the promise of eternal life and dressing us in his righteousness. Whenever you eat and drink, remember these things, that you are sanctified. You are his. He dressed you in his righteousness. Can you imagine this? This, The Lord's righteousness, God's righteousness, that you are perfect before him in Christ alone. What a blessing. What a grace. What love. Who would ever thought people are doing everything to present themselves perfect before their gods? Only in Christianity, God is doing for us because we cannot do anything. We cannot present ourselves perfect before him. Ryan, please pray for us. Our Heavenly Father, we approach your table of remembrance with great humility. And yet at the same time, we come with thankfulness and with praise. Because all who come to this table, we know that our sins are forgiven and remembered no more. Lord, we live in a world where there is so much rush and tear. Everything must be immediate or sooner. And yet, Lord, I pray that as we look at this table, as we see the bread, we are reminded of the incredible sacrifice and punishment that Jesus took upon himself, who did no sin, but he was punished in my place, in our place. As we look at the wine, we are reminded again that our sins are forgiven if we come in true confession and repentance. But not only are they forgiven, they are remembered no more. They are cast into the deepest sea. They are not held against us. We are free in Jesus. Amen. Lord, what more can we say? So we do come with humility, but we do come with thanksgiving and praise. And so as shortly we will take the bread and the wine. May each one of us give you thanks again for your personal sacrifice for us and that we can come and know our sins are forgiven as we confess them to you. And may we be filled with your Holy Spirit that will go out into this day, into this world, this week, and wherever we go, radiate Jesus, that others might know him too, that others too might come 
and meet around this table in humbly and with thanksgiving for their forgiveness of sins. So continue to bless us, we pray, and accept yes. our faith as we ask all these things in our precious name. Precious, precious name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Take, eat, and give thanks, and remember Jesus' death, resurrection, and his return for his church. Jesus set us free from sin and suffering. The Lord of Jesus set us free. Oh, the Lord of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, the Lord of Jesus. Oh, the Lord. Oh, Jesus, it was his white as The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus set us free from seas and sorrow. The blood of Jesus set us free. This is my body broken for you, and as we eat it, remember me. This is my blood for you. And as you think, remember me. This is my brother, working for you. And as you eat, remember me. This is my blood, pour out for you, and as you eat, remember me. Oh, once again I look upon the cross where you died, and I'm humbled by your mercy. And I'm broken inside. Once again, I thank you. Once again, I pour out my life. All the glory, all the glory, all Jesus. All the glory. Of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, it was his white as the snow. Come on to Jesus. No matter what your sin may be, come unto Jesus. No matter what the heavy lady, he's got it all. The blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. We'll retain the cup and we'll drink it together, thanking our Lord for his blood, the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins.
blood of the covenant, eternal covenant, unperishable, eternal. It's the blood of the Son of God who died for us to cleanse us. Lord, we thank you for those wounds. Who could have imagined those wounds on that cross, the king, my king, all that love, Lord. You've asked the Father, forgive them. We thank you for praying for us, Lord. We thank you for asking the Father to forgive us. What a grace, what love, what power. Thank you, Lord. This world my sin is forgiven through the obedience of Christ on the cross. My chin is broken. And my sins forgiven. You've read the Gospels. You've read the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. They were both standing in the temple watching their sacrifices slain. When the tax collector saw that blood, he prayed, forgive me, God, I am the sinner, forgive me. He saw that blood, and he was sure that that blood of the sacrifice will bring him close to God, to bring him with God. As we drink, let's remember the blood of Christ that made us one with him forever and give thanks. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We come to that cross and we give you thanks. We give you thanks, Lord, because we were helpless, humble, not proud, but humble, poor, in need dead, unable to do anything. It's only that blood that can give us life and hope. It's your work. It is your grace. We thank you, Lord, for pouring that grace in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
Let us stand again and sing our final hymn. Build your kingdom here, Lord. Please stand. <laughs> Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We darkness and save people. Save them. Open their hearts and minds to see the beauty of Christ, the King on the cross who rules in love from the cross. He is King. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, keep us from stumbling and to present us blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy the only to the only god our savior 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in peace and serve God. Amen.